evening, everyone. I'm Lynn Fridley, Program Coordinator for Maddie's Institute. Welcome to our webcast, Orphaned Kittens, How Saving the Tiniest Lives Has the Biggest Impact. We have an action-packed presentation for you tonight, along with many resources that you can use to help save your orphaned kittens. Our speakers are Dr. Ellen Jefferson, Executive Director of Austin Pets Alive, and Heidi Beyer, Certified Veterinary Technician. Since 2008, Dr. Jefferson has led the Austin animal welfare community into becoming the largest no-kill city in America. Contributing to this achievement is the Bottle Baby Nursery Program, which coupled with home-based kitten foster care, saves hundreds of kittens' lives each year. Heidi Beyer currently works full-time at a veterinary clinic. She's been fostering and saving orphan kittens for over 20 years. Heidi is a self-sacrificing person who has an incredible heart for these precious babies. Her hope is that others will join her in her passion to give these little ones a fighting chance at survival by becoming a foster parent. Now before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to cover. First, 10 audience members will be chosen in a random drawing for a door prize. Each will receive one snuggle kitty, which acts as a virtual mom with a heartbeat and heat to comfort your orphan kittens. Winners will be contacted via email, so good luck. Next, take a look at the left-hand side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you will ask questions during the event. Dr. Jefferson and Ms. Beyer will answer as many as, as they can at the end of the presentation. But please submit your questions early. Questions submitted in the last few minutes will not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the question mark, which is the help icon at the bottom of your screen. There are other little images along with the help button. These are called widgets. The three green file widgets will take you to the resources that our presenters wanted to share with you, as well as some from Maddie's Institute. Don't worry if you don't get a chance to review them during the event. The resources will also be available on our website after this presentation. Before I turn things over to Dr. Jefferson and Heidi, I want to say a few words about Maddie's Fund. We are the nation's leading funder of shelter medicine education, and it is our goal to help save the lives of all of our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. The inspiration for that goal was a little dog named Maddie who shared her un unconditional love with Dave and Cheryl Duffield. They promised her that they would honor that love by founding Maddie's Fund and helping make this country a safe and loving place for all of her kind. Please use what you learn here tonight to make the dream she inspired a reality. We will start tonight's presentations with Dr. Jefferson. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So the first part of the program, we'll be talking about specifically the Bottle Baby program that we've started in Austin that is um, is a way to deal with in, in, incoming kittens. And um, the second part is, is more about the individualized care of the kittens. So I just wanted to clarify that at the beginning. But um, the, the program that we started in Austin, we, we built it around the concept of not euthanizing animals that are coming into the shelter. And our city in 2007 euthanized at least 1,200 bottle baby kittens. And those were classified as kittens that were under the age of about six weeks. And, um, and we believe that between 1,200 and 2,000 come in every year. So previous to 2008, all of those kittens were, were euthanized. So as we were trying to figure out how do we save this group of animals on a yearly basis, um, we were looking at, at different strategies that um, we knew in other places. And I used to work as a vet in a wildlife center and um, was pretty uh, amazed at how they dealt with incoming baby wildlife. They would get all the baby squirrels that fall out of trees during storms, um, all of the baby skunks, baby raccoons, baby uh, everything, uh, any any wildlife you can think of. And if they would come in by the hundreds, and the, the Wildlife Center uh, didn't even consider euthanasia. So 
the system that they had created, they weren't, because they're wildlife, they weren't really set up to be foster based, which is how we've dealt with dogs and cats previously. But they had a, um, a system in their, in their building where they would set up the, the babies as they come in and put them by species in, in little, um, containers, these little, um, I'll, I'll show a picture later of some of the, the options. But, um, and then they would have an intern or a volunteer start at one side of the room and start feeding the entire room full of babies. And so they would go from cage to cage to cage. Um, they reach the end and then they would start all over again and, and feed everybody again. And they would do that all day long, every day, until the, the babies were big enough to be moved to different parts of the, the wildlife center. And um, so, so what we tried to do with Austin Pets Alive is mimic that model and see if we could make it work for kittens. And, and that's really the main way that this is different than um, a normal shelter program where animals come in, they get the individualized care through a foster um, and then uh, get adopted, you know, from the foster home. This is more of a mass approach to trying to deal with the large numbers of bottle babies that come in. We um, we didn't have a building. In 2008, when Austin Pets Alive started, we didn't have a building. We didn't have any staff. We didn't have um, really any funds either. And we started with the with with trying to create spaces out of nothing. And I think most hopefully most organizations are a little bit further ahead than we were at that point. But um, but we created our first bottle baby program out of this trailer that's on the picture. And it was actually only half of that. The the front half from the Austin Pets Alive forward was the Bottle Baby Ward, and the back half was cat adoptions. And so it didn't hold very much capacity at all, but it allowed us to get started and to have volunteers come to a central place where we had a key hidden, and volunteers would come through the night and through the day and um, take care of the kittens. So it, it shows that you can actually do this anywhere. Um, I Again, I think a, a building is much better, but a trailer worked for us. Um, we, we started with, uh, like I said, no staff. We, we were really reliant on volunteers to run the program. And as we were getting started, it became evident that, that we started putting all of our eggs in the basket of the, the ward or the nursery and um, working really hard on that and not necessarily pushing them to foster because ultimately the goal is to push the bottle babies to foster and have that individualized home experience and um, not have them all in one place for their entire babyhood. But as you're putting all this effort into the to the nursery, um, the foster kind of got forgotten. And so I wanted to just throw this in here, how important it is that the volunteer program part where you're getting feeders lined up and you're having people help with scheduling, and, and I'll go over the job positions in a minute, that's really important for the nursery. But ultimately, moving them to foster is, is critical. And so you can save more lives by keeping the ward and the nursery as a safety net for the kittens that are coming in rather than as a, a end location for them. They shouldn't, the goal shouldn't be to stay there forever. The, one of the big things is getting the nursery covered. Obviously, that's a huge deal when you're talking about feeding lots of kittens every two hours throughout the evening. We have, um, we started with all volunteers and uh, had a, 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 a shift. We had shift leaders that would kind of lead the volunteers that came in. So there might be two volunteers on a, a shift and the shift leader would help the new volunteer or the less experienced volunteer kind of navigate the, the ward and know where everything is and um, what documentation they need to fill out and following disease control protocols. And so it just helps to have um, shift leaders. But the most important thing is the coverage, obviously. Uh, we have a feeder, we have a feeder board and log that we still use. And so as the kittens are fed, the um, it's a whiteboard on the wall and it lists every litter. And as we got bigger, we moved it to multiple whiteboards. But uh, the the concept is that you just need a, a way to um, you just need a way to uh, help people understand where to start, which babies that we're concerned about, and um, and make sure that nobody gets forgotten. So if you have a log and a board, then that's a, that's the checks and balances that you can have in place to make sure that every kitten gets fed. And then we had the lockbox, like I talked about. The volunteers had access to that. And each kitten has a chart, and the chart has the animal's identification information in it, the information from their intake examination, and then also their feeding chart. So we can monitor how much weight they're gaining every day, how much they're eating, if they have any preferences for nipple style or how warm the milk is. Um, that is all jotted down so that 
one person doesn't necessarily have to verbally talk to the next person that's feeding. It's all logged on the chart. And if each person fills out the chart, then it is a communication device that keeps the baby's care constant. Um, this is hard to see, um, small, but we have several ways that we try to communicate. It's a lot of information. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of protocols. We have, um, it, it's impossible for everybody to memorize every single thing. So we try really hard to create ways for people to be reminded about the most important things and also um, uh, make it easy for people to communi communicate about their schedule, about issues they're having, and then any notes about the babies. So we have we use Google Calendar to sign up. People can log in and pick a shift to sign up to. Um, we've we've gone from a self-selecting calendar where people add their own time to one that's more managed, where the manager is trying to get people to sign up for one shift a week, at least one shift a week in advance, so that we're not constantly scrambling to try to cover um, the shifts. And um, we also have a scheduler volunteer that helps to remind people to sign up. Um, reminds people that if they already have signed up, that they're, they need to show up for their shift. Um, sometimes volunteers don't re recall how important it is that they actually show up. And so we try really hard to emphasize that um, their, their volunteer work is essential to making sure that these babies live. We have a Bottle Baby Yahoo group, and this is good and bad. The, the bad is that it's not moderated, so sometimes there'll be tangents or um, information that is not related at all to Bottle Baby care or to the ward that is disseminated and then discussed and it kind of veers everybody off the topic of taking care of the babies. So that's the negative. The, the pro is that if by having this central resource, you can put files on it that anybody can access from anywhere. So if somebody is actually at the nursery and is having trouble recalling something, they can pull up on their smartphone information. Um, and also it keeps every conversation logged for forever. So if like let's say a piece of paper gets lost, you can go back and try to search for that kitten and find out the information um, based on this electronic um, uh, communication device. The whiteboard we already talked about, and then notes we use a, um, uh, sometimes we'll use little, you know, post-it notes to mark, mark a specific animal. We have a critical board that is not on this list now, but um, we use, so if an animal is critical, we can, um, and critical we use as a very, broad um, statement. It doesn't mean the animal is actually critical and needs to be hospitalized. It's that they were concerned about them. So they might have been losing weight. They might not be eating as well. They might um, just look a little bit off or have had diarrhea earlier in the day. And those are the ones that we just want to spend a little bit of extra time making sure that it, each shift checks in on them the first thing that they do. And then the daily log is a way for the volunteers to communicate with each other. That's not necessarily specifically animal related. It might be, hey, we're running low on paper towels, or um, I just set up this new folding laundry system, you know, whatever it is so that the people can be proactively involved in the nursery and then communicate what they've done so that the next group understands and doesn't mess it up. We, um, we have an organizational chart. This is a... Uh, just kind of an overview of it, but we have the manager, the um, even though it looks like the kitten's in charge, the manager is actually in charge, and the um, the other positions that are volunteer are the data manager. This is the person that's responsible for getting the information from the shelter that we're pulling the kittens from, and then making sure that it's entered into our software. We use PetPoint. And that is an online software. It's nice because anybody can use it virtually. So the data manager can be a volunteer that works from home or is, um, you know, even somebody that is, has a desk job and doesn't have a lot to do. This is an easy project for somebody to keep track of on a daily basis and make sure the kittens are well documented in our system so that we can keep track of them throughout. The um, nursing mom coordinator, we started a nursing mom program um, two years ago, and that really helped a lot because there were a lot of mom cats coming through the shelter that were either heavily pregnant or already had just given birth and are lactating. And we found that we can up those that litter size to about six kittens total. So the mother cats, by getting them out of the shelter and saving their lives, they were able to go on and save more kittens' lives. And that was really instrumental in getting our total numbers up because it decreased the burden on people on people to do the actual feeding if the moms were there and able to do it. The moms, um, we would we would test them and the babies. We would we would make sure that the litters were healthy before mixing and um, 
And then also make sure that the kittens are the same age, the mom's litter, and then also the ones that are being introduced so that we can make sure the mom doesn't reject them. And they actually do really, really well. That's been a, a huge lifesaver. We have a volunteer coordinator that works with the volunteers to make sure that they're signing up, they're recruiting at the, vo the volunteer orientations that APA does as a whole, and they are um, signing them up, they're putting them through, um, they're setting them up with a trainer who does training for the volunteers and shows them exactly how to go through all the protocols, how to use the charts, how to weigh the kittens, how to do everything that needs to be done in a consistent fashion so each kitten gets the same care across the board. And then the volunteer coordinator also serves as a mentor so that if if volunteers are having trouble communicating with somebody on their team or if they're um, struggling in any way, then there's somebody to answer their questions that's been through the ropes a little bit, and it helps them to um, keep keep involved. Sometimes if volunteering becomes difficult, people just stop. And what we want after all this work and training them and recruiting them is for them to stay. And so um, the volunteer coordinator and mentor is really important. And they also do appreciation. We have a bottle baby foster coordinator, this person tries to move the kittens from the nursery to foster homes as fast as possible and manages that team of fosters. And then we also have a bottle baby rescue coordinator, and that person is involved with communicating with the shelter where we're taking the kittens from and accepting them if we have room, coordinating transport for them to get them from that shelter to our nursery, and, um, and then making sure the paperwork gets to the data manager. There's two positions that are external to the um, to that um, internal organizational chart, and those are the cat adoption manager. Um, this is critical because we have a, a program where we're handling a specific problem that causes euthanasia in kittens. And once the kittens, once that problem gets fixed or resolved, then the kittens need to be adopted out. Um, obviously, if you're taking in 2,000 kittens, they have to go somewhere. And so the adoption process is critical to move them through the system and get them into their adoptive homes as fast as possible so they don't end up um, backlogging or bottlenecking the system. So it's important that as we're deciding how many kittens we can take as a whole, we have to make sure that we have a program that's big enough to deal with the adoptions also. And, and that's just an important reminder of how the program itself it can't operate in a silo. It has to have an outlet for the kittens to get into their homes. The other piece that is external is the veterinary team, kittens, um, and we'll run through a few of the medical issues that they have, but they do have a lot of issues, and having um, a medical team that is accessible is really important. We didn't start out with the medical team being on site, but um, it helped over time the closer that those two were physically together. So we have the veterinary team now on the same compound as the nursery, and that's that's a huge help over what we were before where the veterinary team would come and make visits to the to the nursery. But that team is also really important. They have to be able to handle the volume. So um, volunteers, like I mentioned, are really, really important. In fact, you can't do it without them. If you're trying to handle a large group of kittens, you have to think about how many times they get fed and how long it takes to feed each litter and then figure out how many people you need per two-hour shift to cover the number of litters that you have. And that's how you figure out how many volunteers you need. And it's pretty astronomical um, when you calculate it. And um, it's important to work on strategies to get volunteers in the door, but then also to keep them. We use positive messaging. Um, we use social media, Facebook. We use signs, um, happy signs at orientation and at our shelter, now that we have a shelter, um, at our shelter to try to draw people in and get them to sign up. We do a presentation during the general volunteer orientation. And we try to keep it fun. It's a lot of hard work. It can be heartbreaking, and but it's really important that, that volunteers come in and they see not only that it's hard work, but that it's also fun and you're building a community of, of fellow volunteers and it's part of a family. And I think that's one of the motivating things, one of the motivating factors for people signing up to volunteer is a lot of people want the social aspect. And this is a great opportunity for that because you can work side by side in the nursery. Um, it is a lot of hard work. Um, I won't stop saying that, but it is a very rewarding process as well. Keeping the volunteers training them well, giving them the ability to own the program, make changes as they are able to improve systems and be part of decision making. That's important to get people to buy in and give the amount of time that we're looking for volunteers to give. Managing expectations. A lot of people hear the words bottle baby and they think it's just going to be adorable little kittens that they can play with all day. 
and then they get in there and are kind of shocked at how much work it is. And so making sure that people know in advance before you spend a ton of time training them that it's a lot of hard work. This is um, not as cute and cuddly as it, it looks. And, um, and then that helps to kind of weed out the people that aren't really serious about getting involved. We expect turnover there. We want to keep every volunteer, but that's not realistic. Um, one of our goals is to keep about 50% of the people that train, and I think that that's actually a good goal. The, um, you know, if you're losing 90%, then that's probably something's not going right. If you're losing uh, only 10%, that's amazing, and you're doing something really, really well. And I think 50% is probably a, a decent ex expectation for how many volunteers stick with it after orientation and then after the training and then after they go through a shadowing process and then stay on as feeders. Some people just change their minds or decide that they don't have as much time as they thought. And then giving people specific roles, that's the point of having a feeder, um, uh, specific feeder roles and job description that goes along with being a feeder. Oh, it looks like we have our first poll question of the evening. Are you planning to start up a nursery utilizing more people than just yourself and your family to care for orphan kittens? This is your opportunity as the audience to chime in, so please select your choice here. Yes, I want to start a nursery at my shelter. Yes, I want to start a nursery at my home. No, I don't have the resources to start a nursery. No, it's too much work. And no, I'm not interested in starting a nursery. So please submit your answers. Um, we will go to the poll results in just a second. I'm going to give you just a few more seconds to submit your answers. Are you planning to start up a nursery? So let's look at the poll results. And Dr. Jefferson, what do you think of that? Wow, that's really interesting. Um, so it looks like a lot of people are interested in starting a nursery at their shelter, and um, I think that's great. I think this is a, a need that is probably everywhere in the country for these kittens, and um, I'm excited to see that there's a lot of interest in this. And hopefully this will be a helpful tool as we go through the rest of the presentation. The um, the typical course for a bottle baby is they're they're picked up so their journey starts at the city shelter. The city gets them from the public. People find them in the in the world out there wherever, um, stumble across a litter of kittens, and then they bring them to the the city shelter, and um, and that's where in the past typically all bottle babies, almost all bottle babies, were euthanized, and it's because they they most city shelters don't have the resources to take care of this high needs group of animals. And that makes sense. Um, the the goal of this program is to try to find an alternative route for them so that they don't end up being euthanized. So they get to the shelter. We generally have about two hours to pick them up. That's when the call or the email is placed to our um, rescue coordinator. And then they figure out transport, find a volunteer to transport them. One of the ways that we keep transporters engaged is that they're the ones that are allowed to name the kittens. We use a, a system for naming that it follows the hurricane system. So um, every litter, it starts at the beginning of the season with the A1 litter and then the B1 and then the C1 and so on. And then as soon as we get to Z, we start all over again with the A2, B2, C2. So as people are going for transport, we tell them what letter we're on, and then every kitten in that group gets a letter, gets a name started with that letter. But it's up to the um, transporter to name them. So that's a really great perk for people, and, and they love it. They love it. So we never have problem with people going to pick up the kittens and bring them over to the nursery. Um, as soon as they are brought to us, we test them for feline leukemia, even if they're a day old. We have um, we have tests for feline leukemia that are separate from the FIV tests, and for kittens under the age of four weeks, um, research shows that there's a possibility that they will test a different test later for Feluc. So we test once when they're very young to make sure that they're not coming in already exposed to the virus or to, to hopefully not be already exposed. And then we, we test them again later in their process when they're six weeks old and make sure that they, they haven't converted um, to positive if they were negative. And then at that point is when we test them for FIV at the same time. For the Feluc test, if they test positive and they're big enough, we will retest with serum. One of the things that um, I've learned through this that I didn't know before was that the IDEX test will um, occasionally cross-react with red blood cells and you can get a false positive. 
So spinning the blood down and doing a serum test with no red blood cells is critical to making sure that's not a false positive result. If it is really positive, then we set them up, we isolate them, we, um, we keep them in the nursery. Um, the actual spread of feline leukemia is very hard to spread them from cage to cage. It's more of the commingling where they're living together in a nest that they spread it. So we'll set them up, but they'll, they'll be somewhat isolated from the rest of the kittens. And then we try to push them to foster. And then again, we'll retest after four to six weeks. And we have a, actually a very high um, conversion rate from negative to positive, which is exciting. Um, and we hope to get some real numbers around that soon to share with people. But, um, but it's, it's good because it, it shows that um, by giving them time for their body to fight off the disease, they, a lot of them actually do. If they're negative, then they proceed into the nursery. And um, on intake, they're treated for fleas with the teeniest little drop of frontline and, um, and given strongid orally for um, p internal parasites. We also give them a shot of penicillin, and the, the purpose of that is that when they're switched from mother's milk to formula, a large number of the kittens will get diarrhea. And so, we, and we found that that diarrhea is responsive to antibiotics, which means that it's a bacterial imbalance, probably due to the diet change. So when we, because the penicillin G lasts for 48 hours after you, each dose lasts for 48 hours, we give that dose at intake, and then that helps prevent a large number of them from getting diarrhea from the diet change. So we started that because it helps us to. Um, it helps us to control the amount of time and energy we're spending on the individual diarrhea cases by treating all of them for diarrhea since a large number of them get up. The, they get charted, they get their charts like I was telling you about earlier, and they all get fed and set up in their kennel and added to the whiteboard. The, um, the protocols that we have, we have a lot of protocols um, because everything needs to be very clearly spelled out for each volunteer to keep it consistent. So we have protocols for how we do intake. We have sanitation protocols. We have prevention protocols for how to prevent ringworm spread, how to prevent upper respiratory and, and diarrhea, um, illness protocols for all of those things, um, feeding and recipes. Those are important because most people that uh, have had any experience with feeding kittens have different ways of making the food, different um, formulas to use, and we need everything to be exactly the same so that we've got a – um, a very consistent program, and each kitten is getting the exact same treatment so we can reliably know what they've had in their past as we're evaluating anything that might go wrong in that kitten's future. And um, and so it really helps to have everything nailed down and solidified and also the volunteers to sign off on it too so they understand where we're coming from. Outcome protocols, sometimes kittens die, and you need a protocol so you know which kittens are not still in the nursery and where they've gone. If they've gone to foster, have they been – um, uh, did they get euthanized? You know, what happened to them? Make sure that we don't lose kittens. It's, it's crazy how easy it is to lose track of the data that is so critical for keeping the program organized. And then the, the protocols for making sure everybody gets vaccinated as soon as they're old enough and um, keeping parasi parasites away. This is an example of our chart. We actually used this from the Wildlife Center. And it has the intake information. It has the, um, you can see in the Second um, row, um, after all the, the animal information, there's an area that shows the date, the time, and then how much food is being given um, to the animal, what type of food, the weight of the, the kitten before it eats, and then the weight after it eats. That's really important because sometimes um, it's hard to know how much they've lost in between feedings. And so you need to know before and after. So you can do a good comparison down, down the entire sheet as the day progresses. And then also noting any eliminations that they um, that they have, if they've had um, stool or urine, and any notes that might come in. And um, let's see. And then it, it also we have a, a, a form for medications to keep track of that. And then anywhere for comments for the, from the vet or from the manager or from anybody else that's taking care of the kitten, so that we have a full file with all the information in one place. Some of the equipment that is necessary in the in the nursery is. A fridge, obviously, microwave for, for warming up formula, but also warming up the snuggle safes. We use those almost exclusively. Um, they're expensive, but they are so much better than heating pads that we really like them. There's no danger of them being burned as long as you, you know, take the precautions that they have listed. They, there's no danger of electrocution. They last for about eight hours at a time, and, um, and they're great. 
Blankets, we use a lot of the soft baby blankets. Um, the kittens really love those. We have hamster cages that are good for up to a certain size, and there's different sizes of hamster cages. We like these because you can easily see in there to see what the kittens are doing. We cover them with a sheet so that no um, cold air can come in. And then it also provides enough of a base for the snuggle safe to be fit in there, and they can't get too far away from their heat. Sometimes kittens will crawl away from their heat, and they, it's too big of a space, so they can't find back and um, find their way back. And so we want to make it so that they can get off the heat, but they're close enough to find it again if it was an accident that they got off. Bowls are important, making sure the type that don't spill water everywhere. We have um, a baby, baby wipe warmer um, that helps with the eliminations, and then the scale is probably the most critical piece. We have tons of scales. Every foster is required to have a scale because weighing before and after every meal is critical to making sure that these guys um, make it. Uh, the nursery attire is not very fancy. We started with just smocks, and the long sleeve smocks are good because they cover um, a person's arms all the way down to their wrists. And these, every single cage of kittens, litter of kittens, has their own smock, and that is put in the bin. They have a, their own bin that's put in the bin with their chart, and um, that helps to limit disease spread from, kit, from cage to cage to cage. We use gloves as much as we can. We, we want to use them on every single kitten um, and change them in between every single kitten, but that's sometimes difficult um, because of costs. Washing hands is as good as long as people are diligent about being able to do that. Closed toe shoes are important, and then having your hair tied back. The hair, um, if people have long hair, if it's dangling in front of the kitten, that is just as good a disease spread as your shirt. So it's important that everything is kept away and the kittens really only having contact with hands and then the smock that's individual for them. We have supplies. We use KMR because we can get it from PetSmart um, overnight. If a volunteer takes kittens home or we run out, then anybody can run to the store and get it. We don't have to wait for it to be ordered and brought in. And so, and we can also order this through MWI, which is our veterinary distributor. And that helps with consistency, so we're never in a place where we've run out of milk and we have to switch brands, which is also going to cause a lot more diarrhea. Bottles, cat litter, we use non-clumping cat litter to try to get them to start eliminating in the right place as soon as they're old enough. Cotton balls, hand sanitizer, all of these things are important. We love the Royal Canin Baby Cat Kibble because it's so tiny and the kittens love it, um, but it, it, consistency is the most important thing. We, um, warmth, which I think will be talked about later, um, but I think that it's important enough to bring up again that it's one of the most important things you can provide to these kittens. They can't maintain their own temperature, so they have to have an external source of heat that's even warmer than a person. A person's not warm enough to warm them up to where they need to be. Some people mistakenly think that if they just hold the kittens and snuggle them closely, that they'll stay warm. That's not enough. They need to actually have um, something that can warm them up to where they need to be, which is closer to 102. The um, never We obviously don't ever place them directly on the heating source. One of the issues that we ran into early is that the nest can get pretty damp. Somebody spills water. Sometimes they're, they're moving around on the blanket and eliminate, and um, you don't want them to end up in a situation where there's a wet patch that then is exposed to the heating pad that then can burn them. And um, kittens have to be warm when they're eating or they won't be able to absorb their food. The um, the one thing that we have have started this year as opposed to last year is a model of all in and all out, and the concept is that every kitten that comes in, every litter that comes in over a week at a time goes into one room. We have the luxury of of several rooms now that are in our new building, and um, so one week's worth of intake will go into one room, and then. Once that week is over, intake is shut, so no new kittens can move into that room. And the foster goal, the foster team goal, is to get all those kittens removed as fast as possible so we can clean that entire room and start all over again. Um, and we have three of these rooms. So the goal is to have every room emptied by the end of three weeks. And then they'll be cycling, so every week we have a new room to work with. And we're hoping that this will help limit disease and kind of minimize risk. If you have a whole bunch of kittens in one room and one breaks with disease, if you've got those rooms separated and different people handling different rooms, then that helps to decrease the amount of spread that that disease can have. And so we're excited to try this. I think it's going to be better than everybody being in one room together. The um, aspirating is important uh, to prevent 
uh, we we have a little protocol here that um, people follow if they accidentally get um, formula down the wrong pipe. Um, one of the thing I like about this picture is that feeding them on their back is one of the main reasons they get this. So we we recommend that they feed upright or pre preferably on their stomach and then drinking from the bottle. And once they've aspirated, we start them on antibiotics immediately to prevent secondary bacterial infection. Medical guide, um, I, there's a lot of information in the handouts that, I, that I've um, prepared, and we have um, certain things that we consider urgent and certain things that we consider important but not necessarily an emergency. And this kind of goes over a little bit of the difference. Um, we we want to be on top of something that is life-threatening immediately, and then the things that we want to watch closely are the ones that we want to prevent from becoming life-threatening. So those are important to deal with that day, but not necessarily an emergency run over to the um, the clinic. Um, typical diseases, I won't go into a ton of detail here just because we've got a lot of that in the supporting materials, but we have protocols that we use for everything, and um, we've set these up for consistency's sake and also based on a lot of experience trying to make different things work. And um, so these are kind of the, the, the different programs that we have, or different protocols that we have for trying to deal with the really common diseases like upper respiratory infection, um, diarrhea, um, kittens that are both vomiting and to have diarrhea. All of that should be listed um, in the supporting documentation. And um, unfortunately, almost every kitten gets sick with something, either diarrhea from food change or they come in with some illness. And so it's um, important to have a good grasp and a good protocol for how to deal with the diseases before they get out of control and before you run out of time to actually deal with it and save their lives. Fading kitten syndrome, um, this is an important thing to, to recognize. Um, there are many, many, many causes of fading kitten syndrome. And it's characterized by kittens that just sort of wind down. So they are um, they're awake and active and hungry and meowing, and then maybe the next time you check on them, they're lethargic. Um, sometimes you can see that queuing up in advance, like they're stopping growing, they're losing weight, they're not nursing quite right, um, they might be a little wobbly or they're just inconsolably crying. And then the next time you check on them, they've, they've faded and become um, really lethargic, almost like they're fainting. And um, it, usually it, it has an underlying cause of disease and sometimes it just hits them so quickly that they can't um, compensate for it like a normal cat would because they're so small and fragile. And so we have a protocol for dealing with that and trying to revive the kitten, get sugar into them, get their blood sugar up, and get them warmed up. Those are the two main symptoms of fading kitten is hypoglycemia and hypothermia. And then it's just as important once they do get revived to get them on appropriate treatment for whatever might be wrong that caused them to do that in the first place. And sometimes that can be a little bit of diarrhea. Sometimes it's upper respiratory. And we have another poll question. Have you experienced fading kitten syndrome? Yes? No? or not applicable, please answer um, whichever one applies to you, and we'll see what the audience says about this question. Have you ever experienced fading kitten syndrome? And here are the results. Wow. Lots of people. Yes. Yeah, it's, um, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a common problem. It's not something every kitten goes through, but it's common enough, and um, there are, uh, I have read, and I don't know how much research is behind this, but um, I've read that even in the wild, 20% uh, of kittens will be lost, even from a good mother that's taking care of them well. And I think that fading kitten syndrome kind of takes the weaker ones. And our goal, of course, is to save every single one of them. But it's important to know that this is out here and that there needs to be a protocol in place to try to revive them. You can actually revive a huge number of them with the right care. We have some videos that um, you can't click on on the screen, but you can find them in the after the, the presentation is over. And they just go over some basic points that really Heidi's going to cover a lot of anyway. But um, it's nice to see a video for reference later for feeding and caring for bottle babies and then also taking care of gruel babies. We call babies gruel babies once they've graduated from the bottle to, um, to starting to eat the, the watered down um, canned food and they're called gruel babies, and that's a little bit um, less intensive than the bottle babies. 
The lesson learned, um, we have lots of lessons learned. We've been doing this for a while. Um, there's lots of things that go wrong. Um, we've, we've learned a lot from issues and problems and obstacles. And um, I hope that a lot of that comes through in our materials. But some of the big things that we've learned is that training, you can't, you can't do too little, too much training. Um, people need to be shown exactly what to do. They need to see it multiple times before they feel comfortable. A lot of people get in there and are kind of overwhelmed with the amount of responsibility. So having at least three training sessions seems to, to uh, mitigate some of that and help people feel more comfortable to step in. Um, a video that people can reference, just like I mentioned earlier, a video actually in the nursery is a really good idea so that people can see over and over and over again where they find things and what to do in an emergency. Weighing kittens before and after they eat is critical. Um, we talked about how important it is to keep track of the weights. And if you kittens are so small, you can't visibly, you can't see it with the naked eye if they're losing weight. So if you're not weighing them with every meal, you can miss weight loss that is almost imperceptible. Well, it is imperceptible to the naked eye, but then the kitten fades. And it's something that you could have prevented if you had known that they were starting to lose a little bit of weight. Vaccinating at one pound, we vaccinate every kitten at one pound because we assume that they're at four weeks of age. Um, we do that to prevent panleukopenia. We do that only for the kittens that are staying in the nursery. If they're in foster, we consider them safe and isolated and we wait until they're six weeks. But if they're in the nursery and at high risk of contracting something because of the density of kittens, then we do vaccinate everybody at one, one pound. Some other lessons learned is that it's easy to get overwhelmed. Um, setting capacity is really a difficult decision, but you need to do it based on the volunteers that you have and the staff that you have so that you don't accidentally take in too many kittens and set them up for failure. We certainly do that before, and it's not pretty, and it's much better to have a, a capacity plan outlined so that everybody knows in advance where the cutoff is. Fosters are critical to setting that capacity because if you can move kittens to foster, then you've increased your capacity in the ward, in the nursery. And sometimes if you have a lot on your plate and you're trying to feed a whole bunch of hungry kittens and then you have a kitten that fades, sometimes you can't revive that kitten. Um, it takes a long time. There's methods that we've been able to employ to keep those kittens going, wrapped in the, the heating pad burrito, getting warmed up, and then getting a squirt of sugar water every few minutes while you're doing something else. And, um, and that's the goal is to save everybody, obviously. Um, but it's important to set priorities as you're working through the whole, the whole room and make sure that you're not losing the end goal, which is to save as many as possible. And that's about it for me.